Good morning. Welcome everyone to the 2020 annual stakeholder day for CDC. We're so sorry that it can't be done in person as usual, but we hope you're well wherever in the world you are. Those of you who have been here before know this is a day where we announce our results, talk about the work we've been doing in the last year, and try to answer any questions uh, that you have. Um, 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 the stakeholder day was actually a suggestion of Lloyd Collins during the CDC Act in 2016, and it's an important date in our diary now. Because of COVID, we've ad adapted our format this year so that we can break up the content as we know how, how challenging long webinars can be. So today is the, is the first of three events. Event two comes on Thursday, titled Climate Action, Investing in a Clean, in clean and Inclusive Growth. And then next uh, week uh, on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday the 7th, Creating Decent Work and Economic Growth. We will, of course, talk about both of those topics today, but those are deeper dives for those of particular interests uh, in those topics. And today we'll cover as much of the business as an hour and a half allows. After some opening remarks by, by, by myself, Nick O'Donoghue, our great CEO, will present our results and talk about the key themes of the year. And then several of the team members will then try to illustrate these themes <coughs> by examples of things we've been doing. And I'm delighted to say that Zainab Badawi will take control of the microphone if we get our timing right, around about 11.20. And she will introduce our guest speaker, Vera Songwe, Executive Secretary for the UN Economic Commission for Africa. We're absolutely delighted that she can, technical, permission, uh, technical abilities uh, permitting, join us live from Addis. Zainab will then chair a panel discussion <coughs> on the implications of COVID-19 for us all with Vera and the team. Finally, Zainab will leave a question and answer session with Nick and myself. And this is a really important part of the session. So we encourage you all to submit questions uh, into the Q&A, which is located at the bottom of your screen or the top if you have an iPad. Um, but to kick us off, let's watch a short video to set the scene for CDC's work in Africa and South Asia over the last year. The world has a global blueprint to achieve sustainable development, the SDGs. And that is why CDC invests in support of them. Countries have 10 years to reach these targets. But the United Nations is sounding the alarm bells that there is a huge funding gap of two and a half trillion dollars per annum. And this shortfall comes at a time of the biggest global economic downturn in recent history. This has strengthened CDC's resolve in supporting the many communities and 1,200 companies it invests in right across Africa and South Asia. This means doing the hardest things with the hardest hit people in some of the hardest places in the world, always in partnership with them. Over the past year, CDC has committed £1.6 billion in businesses supporting productive employment and decent work for more than 850,000 people. This boosts economic growth in a way which ensures that growth is both clean and inclusive to meet sustainable development goals. So at the heart of CDC's strategy is empowering women economically. This is critical to ensuring women have the power to control their own lives and in closing the gap to achieve Goal 5 on gender equality. And crucially, in 2019, CDC committed £230 million in climate finance to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase the resilience of communities from the impact of climate change. CDC's investment to help build successful companies has an impact on people and communities that is clear, measurable and transformative. Over the year, these investments have reached 1.84 million farmers, served 93 million customers and treated more than 12 million patients. 
The goals are ambitious, but they are achievable if organizations across the private and public sectors join forces. Now, more than ever, champions like CDC are leading and accelerating efforts to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals towards a decade of action on leaving poverty behind. Ever since our creation in 1948, as the world's first development finance institution, CDC has tried to make a positive impact on the world. Lord Reef, our second chairman, described CDC's mission as doing good without losing money. Now, CDC has evolved over the decades, the geographies and the economics of development have shifted, but our basic mission has been constant. And we are proud to be part of the UK's international effort to meet the SDGs and to help remove the systemic inequalities that as recent events around the world have shown, hold people, communities and countries back from achieving their full potential. Of course, COVID has made these issues even more apparent and the pandemic has profound implications for CDC's work. At our board meeting in early April, we committed ourselves to do the very best we can within our existing resources to respond to COVID, and you'll hear about that response later. But we also committed to carry on delivering all the rest of our commitments we made in our current strategy. So with that in mind, let me give you some context of the work that's underway. As you can see in this slide, this last decade has been one where we've been executing an ambitious but phased build-up with the fantastic support of the UK government through DFID. Back in 2010, CDC was much smaller than the equivalent development finance institutions of, for example, the USA, Germany, France, and Holland. <clears throat> CDC and our shareholder believe there was a high demand and a need for CDC's particular brand of long-term patient capital. So with a radical new strategy, launched in 2012, we started out on the current chapter of CDC's history. In line with this strategy, all our new commitments since 2012 have been made to Africa and South Asia. For comparison, our peers typically com commit less than 50% to these regions. Throughout this build-up, we've always strived to achieve Lord Reith's twin goals, achieving development impact, which is our purpose, whilst investing responsibly. Getting this balance right is terribly hard, especially as we're investing in some of the most challenging parts of the world. And as some of you heard, have heard me say before, it can require perpetual paranoia, and even then we can make mistakes. Measuring development impact is crucially important for our task, but it's notoriously hard to do well. We started out in 2012 with the development impact grid. At the time, it was a very innovative, and as the facts prove, it's been extremely powerful in reallocating our capital to the poorest parts of the world. But we committed to refine and improve our approach to targeting and measuring development impact in the current strategy period. And you will hear a lot more about that today uh, from Nick and the team. To the other side of our ledger, financial returns. Those who have been regular readers of our annual reports or listen to our comments in Parliament over the last seven years, will have heard our guidance that our financial returns will trend down over time. As you can see, this has become true. Of course, like all investors, we've made mistakes, but there are many structural reasons why returns are falling and why we believe this will be the case. Above all, Africa and South Asia have had significantly lower historic private market returns than the other markets that CDC used to invest in. Two other points to note. Firstly, you shouldn't read into this chart that the returns in the current strategy period have been less than the 2012 to 16 period. Public market and revaluation movements and legacy portfolio changes were the key drivers. Secondly, note the impact of the global financial crisis on CDC back in 2008. And as the financial and economic implications of COVID play out over the next year, we expect increased challenges and volatility in our portfolio. As we start discussions with our shareholder about the next five-year strategy, we'll be reaching out to many of you to learn how we can do better 
and how we can improve collaboration so we can work together to meet the SDGs. We're grateful for both the support, but also the constructive criticism that you give us. Scrutiny is not only essential given we're investing taxpayers' money, but, but the challenge of it improves us. And I can assure you, we have the team to rise to this challenge. One of CDC's key values is tenacious in the face of challenges. I honestly can't think of a more challenging time in CDC's 72 years history to be trying to execute our mission than during the current crisis. But the personal leadership of Nick and his great executive committee over these last months, with literally non-stop, sometimes 24-7 video meetings, and the response has been inspiring, the response by the team has been inspiring. So with that, over to you, Nick. Thank you all for, for joining us this morning. Everybody at CDC is driven by a desire to help achieve the sustainable goal, the sustainable development goals. And I think the video that we showed at the beginning made the point that we have a decade, we have 10 years to achieve those goals. Uh, we need roughly two and a half trillion dollars a year in funding to do that. And I think by common consent, we know that that can't be done without the growth and the support of the private sector. And the private sector can't grow and provide that support without capital. And that's really the critical role of, of DFIs and it's the critical role of CDC to invest and to mobilize that capital, uh, support that growth in a way that improves people's lives. But I think it's also important when we talk about the SDGs to say that we can't be equally effective across all 17 of them. And uh, we should be uh, development finance is a complement to, it's not a substitute for grants. But there are many things that we can do. Uh, we can help build green and renewable infrastructure to provide power to the 650 million people in Africa who currently don't have access to reliable power. And we could do that in a way that helps mitigate uh, the critical challenge of climate change. We can help unlock the financial system to make it more accessible and more inclusive to lower income groups, especially to women, uh, and more accessible to small and medium sized enterprises so they can create uh, critically needed jobs. We can invest in new and emerging technologies to make basic goods and services more affordable and more accessible to the vulnerable and disadvantaged. And those are the type of things that we look at every day at CDC. Fundamentally, as we, uh, as, as we look at the next slide, um, we, have, uh, we are an investor with two objectives. We are, um, uh, every investment that we make starts with a question. And that question is around impact. How much of what we do, how, how can we, by making this investment, change lives? And every investment that we make is scrutinized with that question in mind. And we'll talk a little bit later about how precisely we do that. But also critically, we have to ask a financial question. Um, and that's an equally important question. It's, uh, uh, you don't create any long-term impact by supporting unsustainable businesses. And the tools and the rigors of financial analysis are fundamental to what we do. And the great strength of development finance, or one of the great strengths of development finance, is that it recycles, if done properly, it recycles capital. Um, so the discipline to ensure that that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that recycling takes place is not inconsistent uh, with improving people's lives. So I want to um, talk a little bit about our financial, uh, about our results. And I'm going to start with our financial results. Uh, and as the next slide shows, um, we have, uh, as Graham said, uh, in the last uh, 12 months, or in the, the year of 2019, committed uh, just over 1.6 billion pounds. That is a, uh, the single largest amount that CDC have committed in its 72 year history. It's also the largest amount committed for the first time CDC uh, uh, committed the largest amount by any European development finance institution increased our overall portfolio to 6.4 billion pounds. But as Graham noted, we made a loss in 2000, a financial loss in 2019 of 6.2%, and that equates to about 2.1% in dollars. That means that over the la since in the period since 2013, our average return has declined, as the, as the table on the right shows, to 7.4% or 5% in dollars. And our job um, and the job of development finance means taking risk. It means going difficult places. It means investing for long term. 
Um, and inevitably, that means you have a volatile portfolio and sometimes you lose money. In the, in the year of 2019, our, um, our portfolio returns were most affected, well, first of all, by our develop, a, a developmental strat strategy that deliberately uh, since 2012 has been seeking, um, seeking higher risk. And the value of the, the financial results, as Graham highlighted, depend on the uh, uh, investments made over a period, over, over a period of years. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, we lost money because of currency, and the, um, uh, we're very particularly susceptible to the, to the sterling US dollar rate. Um, and as sterling increases, dollars decline, uh, that leads to a loss in for, for CDC. Uh, we were vulnerable to Indian, uh, Indian, the Indian financial uh, stocks, uh, something over 10% of the portfolios invested in Indian financials. And we do that to support financial inclusion in India, to support women's economic empowerment, to help fund uh, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. In particular, we focus on doing that in, in, in poorer states. But last year was a difficult year for Indian financials and the prices uh, fell and that led to a loss. And then we had losses in some of our consumer and agriculture uh, investments in Africa. But of course, the financial return is only half the story. So if I move on to the, to the uh, impact side of the ledger, um, really, there are two significant challenges for impact investors uh, when they think about impact. And the first challenge is how do you manage for impact? You know, what are the questions that you ask uh, every time you make an investment? And the second challenge is, once you've made the investment, how do you measure and report, uh, and report your impact? And I think probably the biggest change in the, in the investment decision-making process at CDC in 2019 uh, was, the op was the adoption of the impact management uh, project. And that's a, that's a framework that's used by over 2,000 impact investors around the world. And it's a disciplined framework, as this uh, slide illustrates, which, which looks first at, co uh, in CDC's case, at contribution. Um, so, uh, you know, how additional are investments? If we don't make them, would somebody else make them? To what extent are the investments we make mobilizing capital? Then it looks at how we are achieving impact. Is that direct impact by uh, uh, direct job growth in the companies we invest in? Or, the, or are the impacts more indirect by providing power that helps um, power schools, hospitals, factories, and homes. Um, and then we look at the ultimate impact. Uh, what exactly, what difference are we making? Who are we making it to? Who are the beneficiaries? And how much are we, how, how much uh, uh, difference and how are we really making? And we try to capture all of that on the impact, what we call the impact dashboard. And Liz Lloyd, our chief impact officer, who'll speak later, will go through more details and a specific example of how that works. If I move on to the question of, of how we measure and maximize our development impact, um, we do that at, on three levels. First of all, on a portfolio level, um, the biggest challenge of impact measurement, or one of the biggest challenges, is aggregation. Um, we aggregate, acro uh, we aggregate uh, across our portfolio in three areas, on jobs, on taxes, and on mobilization of capital. We also increasingly um, particularly during this strategy period, have tried to look much more closely at the sector and thematic impact. So define critical metrics for each sector that we can benchmark and look at our results against. And, and thirdly, of course, we look, at our, we look at our impact on an individual investment level every time an investment, uh, a potential transaction comes to the investment committee. So let me share some of the, some of the results with you um, on those metrics. First of all, um, on the next slide, uh, we, uh, uh, we look at the jobs numbers. Um, as we said earlier in the video, um, CDC supports over 875,000 direct jobs in our portfolio. But of course, that's only part of the story. Uh, though the companies in which we invest don't just employ people, uh, they have supply chains, they pay wages, which in turn support other jobs. Uh, in some cases, they generate power, which allows jobs to be created and factories to be built. Uh, they uh, provide lending, which helps support and provide credit to, uh, to growing companies. So it's a much broader story than just direct jobs. On the direct jobs metric alone, our average annual job creation rate among the companies uh, that we've invested in is 5.9%. That compares with 3.4% with for uh, average uh, the job creation rate for all the companies across our region. 
But of course, it's not just enough to, um, to create jobs. The critical question is what type of jobs and what's the quality of those jobs. And one of, the one of the sections that you'll find in the report this year and the review this year is a section on how we ensure good practice in job creation. And that means looking at things like uh, um, increasing worker voice. It means looking at uh, protecting invisible workers. It means uh, thinking about how companies can have better HR policies. Uh, better progression, more inclusion. Uh, so it's going beyond compliance. It's going beyond just are people properly paid, although that's a critical issue, or are, do they have adequate health and safety, although that's a critical issue. It's really about what can we do as an investor to make sure the company is doing everything it can do to really help the employees and the workers meet their full potential. Um, the next slide is on mobilization of capital. Uh, we mobilized last year uh, 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 um, 900 million, roughly $900 million, depending on what methodology you use, uh, roughly $900 million of additional private capital alongside our investments. I think we also, um, for the first, we, uh, at the end of 2018, we formed what we call the Funds and Capital Partnerships Group because we feel, like, we feel that mobilization goes beyond just who's joining alongside you in a particular fund. And we spent a lot more time working with local banks, um, working to share uh, in risk partnerships, to increase uh, trade finance, to increase areas like supply chain fina finance, to target specific, help these banks target specific lending towards, uh, towards, um, um, uh, towards uh, um, SMEs. And that helps us get much deeper into the countries and into the markets that we uh, that we are um, uh, um, that are in our geographies. And in fact, the smallest loan that uh, uh, CDC made last year was one for only six dollars. So we've really tried to focus on broadening our reach and uh, and using intermediaries, using banks to provide uh, uh, smaller amounts of capital and reach smaller companies. Um, so the next slide talks about the sector and thematic impacts. Um, and there, as I said, we've tried to look individually at sectors to try and highlight what the critical metrics are. Um, CDC's investments in power infrastructure generate 57 terawatt hours of power. That's about enough power to power the whole of the UK for two months. Um, CDC's financial institutions serve 93 million customers. Um, that's almost double the number in 2017. Our healthcare investments treated over 12 million patients. Our agriculture investments reached almost 2 million farmers. So all of these represent um, lives being changed, we hope, in a, in a material way. I want to close uh, by just talking a little bit on a couple of areas of how we're evolving. And so if we go to the next slide, um, we are, um, one of the key um, uh, 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 initiatives at CDC is to try to take a more flexible ap approach to risk and pursuit of impact. And what we're really trying to do is, is take higher risk to try and create enhanced impact. And we're very lucky because our shareholder at DFID has given us a specific pool of, ca separate pool of capital, which we now call Catalyst Capital. And the role of that capital is to seek higher is to is to seek higher risk in return for enhanced impact, and it's allowed us to do a lot of a lot of things that CDC wouldn't have been able to do in the past, and that and most of our peers wouldn't be able to do today. So it includes, for example, uh, setting up a new company to invest in transmission and distribution in Africa of power, which is a critically ignored area by by most uh, development finance institutions. It's allowed us to set up a company called MedAccess, which provides guarantees to help supply uh, critical uh, pharmaceuticals and, and, and diagnostic products. And as we speak, is working on a guarantee to, uh, uh, for um, a COVID, COVID testing kits, which are desperately needed in Africa. It's helped us to support uh, a Pan-African solar company that's helping to de uh, develop uh, battery storage to power particularly commercial and industrial projects around Africa. Um, so I think, as I said, I think that the, the existence of capitalist, ca capitalist capital gives us an opportunity to do things that, as I said, would not normally be, in, would be within the remit of, mo of most development finance institutions. Uh, secondly, we're evolving by growing in terms of growing geographically. And the next slide shows that um, we have in the uh, uh, in 2017, CDC had almost nobody working outside of, of the UK. Uh, today, we have nine offices. Last year, in 2019, we opened three new ones in Dhaka, in Karachi, and in Lagos. 
we uh, significantly expanded, particularly in Nairobi, Johannesburg, and in India. And we think it's absolutely critical to be local. You need those networks, you need those relationships, you need to understand the issues, the critical issues uh, that uh, uh, people who live, live in, in, the, in these geographies are facing and the role that an organization like CDC can, uh, can, can, uh, uh, can play in helping them. Um, so we will continue uh, throughout uh, through the next uh, last couple of years of this strategy period to increase our geographic footprint. Okay, so now I think uh, we want to move on to talk about um, some of our uh, other some of our priority areas in a little bit more detail and perhaps color them with a few with with some uh, specific advantages. So um, and we're going to have um, Liz Lloyd, who's our chief impact officer, talk more about our impact framework and give you examples of how it's used. Specific example, Chris Coles, our chief investment officer, is going to talk about how we um, how we manage the portfolio, how we assess risk. Um, uh, Jen Braswell, who's led our, our gender work, is going to talk about um, our work in, in helping and that's an area where we think we are very much a leader among development finance institutions. And finally, and critically, uh, Amma Lee, who's head of our climate strategy team, is going to be talking about how CDC is investing for clean and inclusive growth, aligning our investment strategy with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, so before I hand it over to them, I, we're going to show we're a short film, a short film to hear from one of our investees. So iMerit is a technology services company. We are 54% women. The average age of the workforce is about 24.1. About 80% of people are from under-resourced areas. When you are building an inclusive workforce, it becomes very important to have investors who are aligned with you. COVID. It hits the people who are under-resourced the most. Combat COVID, that's our spirit. Right from the beginning, CDC asked us how they can help. And for that, I say this very sincerely, we are really grateful to the CDC team. Thank you, Radu. Now I'm going to turn it over to Liz. Liz? Good day, everybody. Um, so today we wanted to talk you through how we think about impact um, using the example of that particular investment made by CDC in the last year. Um, so perhaps we can turn to the next slide. Um, it's the company you just saw, saw the short video of called iMerit, with a workforce largely in India and Bhutan, over half of whom are women. Uh, their business is data labeling and annotation for artificial uh, intelligence and machine learning. And one of the many attractive things about this company is how it is connecting the digital economy with some of the most underserved communities in providing decent jobs with prospects. Next slide, please. This slide shows our impact dashboard. Uh, this is a way in which we summarize the extensive analysis behind the impact case for all of our investments. As Nick mentions, we have aligned with the impact management project a framework used by a community of 2,000 other impact investors. And as you can see here, we link to the sustainable development goals. Uh, each, each investment is linked with specific goals. In this case, it is around providing economic opportunities by creating decent work. We do extensive qualitative and quantitative due diligence on the impact case for the company and assessing its growth plans. Here, colleagues worked with their investment uh, and financial um, team members um, to look at uh, the business growth case, but also undertook fo focus groups with the workers and met with management. Uh, we assessed the characteristics of the stakeholders who are benefiting from the investment here from low income families and households. There was great synergy with the management who already understood the impact on the lives of, of workers, their workers. For example, the benefits in education and water and sanitation that the wages brought to, 
to households. So we could look through um, to the greater impact on the community. We also ask if there's a qualification for 2X, which as Jen will talk about later, is a global initiative which CDC has been at the forefront of, of gender lens investing. In this case, it's met um, as there's a female founder and over half the workforce are female. Um, we also uh, assess our contribution, whether that's through capital or beyond capital, and how we work with the, cap with the company to bring value. We found a clear alignment with the values and approach of the management here and ways in which we could reach, enrich the workforce and the governance. So in particular, we're looking at how we can work with the company to improve uh, the training and the opportunities for progression of the workforce. This uh, impact dashboard is the model that we use for all of our investments. It allows us to bring consistency. It allows us to bring a logic to the way we invest. It also sets baselines uh, and uh, um, baselines for what we're going to measure in terms of our eventual impact. Um, let me over, hand over now to our Chief Investment Officer, Chris Coles, to say more about the investment process. Thank you, Liz. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is um, Chris Coles, and I'm um, CDC's Chief Investment Officer. <clears throat> and um, building on um, Liz's presentation, I'm going to just talk uh, briefly about how we assessed I merit um, in our investment decision making process. Um, so, next slide, please. So, the timeline here um, and the various milestones are our standard, uh, is our standard investment decision making process for all our direct equity transactions. iMerit was a, an investment of uh, just under $20 million. As you can see, the process started with a detailed sector mapping exercise in early 2019. Screening Investment Committee approved the opportunity in terms of agreeing to dedicate uh, CDC resourcing and establishing a uh, budget to commence uh, external due diligence. There were then two further investment committees to review the detailed due diligence findings and ensure the investment and development impact thesis were both on track. And then this investment uh, closed towards the end of 2019. That's actually um, quite a short time, timeline for our direct equity transactions. So it's actually a very smooth and uh, efficient process. And I would also just add that Liz's impact framework um, was debated and discussed at every, uh, every stage of the IC decision-making process through screening through to final. Uh, next slide, please. So why did CDC make the ultimate decision to invest? First of all, due diligence confirmed in particular that the market was growing very fast. So the employment growth prospects, we believe for this business will be very robust. But in addition, staff turnover within the company was exceptionally low and investment in training exceptionally high. And it was also, as you've already um, seen, a, uh, a women-led business. Um, furthermore, we found that the customer references from the existing client base were extremely robust. And last but not least, we think we have a very strong and dedicated uh, senior management team and promoter. Where we had to get comfortable, it's still a very early stage investment for us. Clearly, it's engaged in new technology, competition and the sustainability of the business model were all topics that were debated extensively through the investment committee process. Ultimately, there were significant investment risks, but the high development impact made these risks, in our view, worth absorbing. On that basis, I'd like to um, hand over now to my colleague, Jen. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. As the Director of Value Creation within CDC's Impact Group, 
I oversee CDC's core thematic strategies, including our gender strategy. Promoting gender equality and closing gender gaps in the private sector is a core impact goal for CDC, and we take it seriously. The field of gender finance, also known as gender smart investing or gender lens investing, is new but growing. And over the past three years, we at CDC have been on a journey to build our own gender finance capabilities and also to become a leader, working to influence and encourage our other investors to build the broader field. Gender smart investing gives us clear sight of where women actually are participating in our portfolio companies and allows us to place value on that role and make investment decisions accordingly. It also allows us to see the gaps clearly and to point them out when we work with our investee partners, to ask the questions, to build alignment, and to support companies to take action and make changes in their businesses to improve gender balance. Next slide, please. I'll focus in now on some of the very practical and tangible reasons why we're becoming gender smart as an investor. In the context of the four key areas that we prioritize as part of our gender strategy. First, we look at women entrepreneurs, business owners, suppliers, who tend to be innovative and resilient and who also are the most underserved from a finance perspective. World Bank statistics show that upwards of 33% of private businesses worldwide are owned and operated by women, but that many of those are, and that many of those are in developing countries, including in CDC's markets, where women owned small and medium enterprises currently face a finance gap of $1.7 trillion. That gap alone for investors is a significant investable opportunity. We also focus on women as business leaders, on boards and senior management teams, and importantly, as senior investors in funds and financial institutions. McKinsey has found that companies with women in top management are 21% more likely to outperform a national average. And a study recently by the IFC looking at hundreds of private equity and venture capital investment funds found that those funds with gender balanced investment teams have 10 to 20% higher performance in their portfolios, and they're 65% more likely to invest in gender balanced and women supporting businesses. Next, we look at women in the workforce. Uh, the World Bank has found that up to 25% more labor, labor productivity can be achieved by removing barriers to employment for women. And when women are engaged as earners, the majority take that income and they reinvest it to grow their businesses and to buy goods and services that improve the welfare of their families and communities. And finally, as part of our gender strategy, we, uh, we look at women as consumers. Current estimates indicate that somewhere between 65 and 85% of global household spending is control controlled by women, yet very few products and services are cu currently being specifically designed for women. We see that as a significant opportunity. So turning to the current slide, how are we at CDC getting gender smart to address the gaps and to realize the opportunities? First and foremost, we're applying the gender lens and we're investing in women. And now that may sound like a simple undertaking, but what it requires is making changes, often significant changes, to our business as usual ways of investing. It requires us to define what good looks like. Where are the benchmarks and thresholds for women's participation per sector, for example? It requires us to develop internal tools and resources to evaluate our deals differently. It requires our investment teams and our investment committee to be trained to ask the right questions and to determine where there's alignment with investee business leaders to address imbalances. But it also gives us opportunities. It gives us the opportunities to target our investment strategies to intentionally support women. Like with our trade, our current trade and supply chain finance facility, which prioritizes providing critical finance to women owned suppliers. And our new directed lending strategy, which enables our financial intermediaries to develop earmarked lines of credit for women entrepreneurs and borrowers with bespoke underwriting approaches that overcome some of the structural challenges women face in securing credit. Next slide, please. Another way that we've been getting gender smart is by working hard to build the field and the ecosystem of supporting players that are needed to promote gender equity. In 2017, we founded and chair the Gender Finance Collaborative, which is a community of practice among 15 DFIs that have been working very actively together to share resources and learning, to build practical investment tools together, and most recently to establish co-investment pipelines. 
In 2018, as Liz mentioned, we joined with the other six DFIs from the G7 countries to launch the 2X Challenge, which was an ambitious commitment to invest $3 billion by the end of 2020 in businesses that meaningfully support women. I'm pleased to announce today that we have exceeded that goal. As of the end of March of this year, we have collectively committed $4.1 billion in gender smart investments. This gives us confidence to raise our ambitions and to do more in the coming few years. Finally, over the past three years, we've seeded and championed a number of important ecosystem players like the Boardroom Africa, a network of over 700 board ready senior women professionals across the continent and the Gender Smart Investing Summit a fantastic annual convening and virtual community of gender finance investors. Next slide, please. So the last way that we're becoming gender smart at CDC is by working with our investee business partners throughout the life of our investment relationship with them to understand the valuable role that women play in their business and to make gender smart changes. I have the pleasure to oversee a dedicated team of gender finance specialists within CDC who provide advisory support and technical assistance to our investee companies. And I'm gonna to close today with a very brief spotlight on a company that we've been working with this year called Ecom Express. Ecom is India's second largest e-commerce logistics company. It operates across India in over a thousand cities and towns. And e-commerce is growing in India, even during and indeed particularly due to the COVID crisis, e-com is expected to grow both in geographical reach and headcount. But despite its scale, female representation at e-com is very low. When we were reviewing the company for investment, we found that only 1.5% of the total workforce were women, with particularly low levels of representation among delivery professionals. So when CDC was deciding at the end of last year whether to invest in e-com to support a significant growth and workforce expansion plan, we had an open conversation with the company about gender diversity, about the disparity we were seeing, and we found that they were in fact aligned with us and agreed with us on a time-bound plan to increase, increase representation significantly over the next couple of years. So over the course of this year, even during the crisis, CDC has helped Ecom to first undertake an, a diagnostic and then to implement a gender action plan, which includes initiatives around improving recruiting practices, um, providing better facilities for female employees, training and marketing and communications. The photo here is from one of those gender diversity and inclusion workshops that the company has been running to implement the plan. We're looking forward to working with Ecom and the dozens of other gender product projects we now have underway with our investee partners to realize this goal and to continue to promote gender equality in our portfolio and across our markets. I'll close there and we'll turn the floor over to Amali Amin, our climate change director, to give an overview of our new climate change strategy. Thank you, Jen. So I'm now going to give an overview of our climate agenda in 2019. Uh, move to the next slide, please. And here you'll see a uh, focus in three main areas. The first really, investing for climate action. Uh, last year, we uh, financed uh, £230 million of our commitments were climate finance, which was up from £188 million in 2018. And over the last uh, few years, since 2017, this represents 20% of our total commitments uh, as being climate finance. And so as examples of the types of investments we've made, uh, three 50 megawatt wind farms in Pakistan, which uh, very importantly, not only helps provide uh, power, uh, reduces emissions, but also very significantly can um, bring GDP benefits and lots of jobs. I think in, in this case, estimated as over 6,000 uh, indirect jobs associated with these three wind farms. As another example is Metal Solar, a company pioneering the use of solar power and battery storage for businesses in Africa. And actually in this case, we estimate that through uh, the, uh, the uh, businesses uh, supported, Metal Solar could actually lead to a 40% uh, increase in, uh, a decrease rather, in energy use. So very important uh, part of the energy security agenda, as well as delivering on the climate agenda. We also have been working with our investees. And three examples here, uh, 14 trees, uh, working uh, to bring very innovative solutions for green buildings 
that can uh, improve the resource productivity around buildings uh, for affordable housing in particular, but also very important, it reduces the drivers for deforestation. Another key investee that we've worked with is Ayana, um, a utility scale renewable energy company in India that CDC invested in in uh, 2018. And over the last year, we've been working with uh, Ayana and also with DFID to help build uh, the necessary skills, provide the training for local communities, particularly women, to be able to uh, gain employment in the solar park farm that was invested in. And this will be uh, very much uh, the approach we will continue to take as part of uh, what we refer to as a just transition to climate change. And then looking to adaptation and resilience and how to build more resiliency to both existing and future climate impacts. A good example of how we uh, engage with an investee, Zephyr Power, has been to uh, look at uh, where the wind farms were situated on wetlands, uh, actually quite degraded from over grazing and uh, human use. And we worked there with Zephyr Power to uh, restore these mangroves, which brings very uh, clear ecological benefits, but also very, very strong community benefits through increasing the fish stocks and providing local communities with uh, new economic opportunities. And also very importantly, ensuring that the wind farm and the surrounding uh, road infrastructure is more resilient to potential flooding in the future. And last year, we also signed up to the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure as the emerging um, best practice for uh, companies to uh, assess and report on climate risk and opportunities. So having signed up, uh, we've worked to adopt the framework, which uh, includes both a strategy, which I'll turn on to in a minute, but as well as that integrating climate related uh, risks and opportunities into the governance of CDC and a number of uh, measures have already been undertaken towards that as well as looking to uh, more effectively integrate climate risk and resiliency into our risk management and of course also our reporting framework. And so we, uh, in light of the TCFD and of course recognition of the urgency of addressing the climate crisis in our markets, we also developed a new climate change strategy last year. Next slide, please. And as you can see, the strategy sets out our approach towards alignment to the Paris Agreement. And in seeking to align to the Paris Agreement, we've set out three main building blocks. Very importantly, these three building blocks each uh, help to ensure that we can contribute to the economic transformation of our markets to achieve net zero, but also ensure socially just transition, whilst also increasing resiliency to climate impacts. The first building block is uh, to set, we have set uh, the objective to become net zero by 2050. I think as leading um, uh, financial institutions and governments around the world are also seeking to do. So having set this uh, goal, we're now working to uh, assess how we may reach that goal. But very importantly, we will look at each individual investment and also consider how that can support a country's transition to net zero. The second building block is around a just transition. So the example in the previous slide of Viana, where we worked with local communities to help uh, skill and provide uh, employment opportunities is a prime example of the type of activity we will continue to do as we enable countries and communities and workers to a socially just transition to net zero emissions. And the third building block relates to adaptation and resilience. We know that our markets are particularly vulnerable to climate impacts and probably some of the most vulnerable uh, in the world. And so it's very important that we look to increase the resiliency of our portfolio companies, working with them to help ensure they can better assess, anticipate, and then manage climate-related risks 
and ensure resiliency to those. We will also look to invest more in sectors and business solutions that are specifically targeted to support countries, uh, sectors, uh, communities with adaptation and resilience to the physical impacts of climate change. We'll be talking much more about that tomorrow, um, uh, sorry, on Thursday when we have the second of our annual review events, if, if you'd like to hear a bit more about that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Anna Lee Amin there, for telling us about all the um, amazing things that uh, CDC is involved in in the, in the area of climate change. Uh, Chairman Graham Wrigley, your colleagues and everybody else who's involved in this annual review, I'm Zainab Badawi, and I am delighted to be um, part of this uh, discussion today because towards a decade of action and 10 years to achieve the SDGs, Oh boy, do we really need to um, know that we have to do this now? Because of course, everybody's focus has been shifted because of the emergency created by COVID-19. And that's what we're here today to discuss about the importance on not losing sight of these very, very important goals. So in this part of our annual review, I have the pleasure of um, being joined by Vera Songwe, who's the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, based in Addis Ababa. So please start thinking about what you might want to ask her in the Q&A session that you'll have uh, with Vera after I've uh, warmed her up a little bit for you and had a chat with her about um, their ambitions um, for Africa and what the obstacles are. And then we'll also have um, a discussion with um, some of the team from from, uh, CDC um, ending with Q&A for the chairman Graham and also the CEO Nick so think about what you might want to ask them also and I'm told that it's no holds barred so please be as uh, frank as you like and they will be as frank as they can be but let us first of all just bring you a brief overview of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic globally with um, a bit of a highlight also and what it means for Africa so let's play this video. Thank you. Individuals, communities and governments across continents are grappling with the twin shocks of the COVID-19 pandemic on health and wealth. The number of people infected has passed 10 million and around 500,000 have died from the virus. The World Health Organization is warning of a second wave and says the disease has yet to peak in some regions. This puts extra pressure on healthcare systems that are already overwhelmed in parts of the world. And national lockdowns and curfews have taken a huge toll on economies. GDP is projected to fall dramatically in most countries, pushing a billion people globally into poverty. Africa, for instance, will experience its first recession in a quarter of a century. Its economic growth had been forecast at just over 3% this year. It's now been revised downwards to between 0 and 1%. And it's estimated that at least 20 million jobs could be lost across the continent. Millions of households, especially those in the informal sector, are already suffering big drops in their income in nations with few, if any, safety nets. But amidst the doom and gloom is a glimmer of sunshine. The pandemic has brought changes to the way we live, work, travel and order our societies. And many want to hold on to the changes we value, like increased family and community connection and reduced air pollution. When the world emerges from the coronavirus crisis, there's an opportunity to build back better and address the inequities that have been exposed by the pandemic. Leave no one behind is the rallying cry for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And this is why CDC invests in Africa and South Asia to build resilience and promote prosperity in a sustainable and inclusive way. So there you have that uh, overview. So I'm hoping now that we could be joined on the line from Addis Ababa by Vera Songwi. Um, the connection there means that she cannot be with us um, via Wi-Fi, but uh, we can hear you. Vera. Can you um, hear me clearly in London? Hello. 
Yes, please. Yes, please. Normally, I should be able to do this, but today we have a, diff- a, a particular circumstance. Sorry about that. That's okay. I think everybody can hear you loud and clear, Vera. So thank you so much indeed for joining us. Um, Vera, just start off by giving us a kind of overview, a thumbnail sketch of what COVID-19 has meant for the continent of Africa. How worried you are? Is there some optimism amongst the pessimism? And just highlight your main areas of concern for us. I think three things. And thank you very much. And good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for having me. Uh, in the session. Hi, uh, Zainab. Um, three things uh, to answer your question. Some optimism, uh, some pessimism, and a little bit of uh, hope. Um, on the optimism side, or uh, let's start with the pessimism side, I think I just heard from uh, uh, the, the, the segment that you showed before, growth. And what we are looking at is growth. The IMF has just come out last week with new growth numbers. Um, of course, Africa's growth is very aligned to world growth. Our main trading partners being Europe, Asia, and the United States. And growth in all these three geographies are dropping. Uh, 6% negative growth in some of them, negative 3% growth worldwide and going further. So we see um, Africa's growth. We had pro- projected that it will drop from 3.2%, which already was not good enough. Africa needs, at the beginning of uh, last year, we were saying we need a double digit growth. Uh, to be able to make it to 2030 and get uh, the decade of action in full swing to meet the 2030 agenda. Now we believe that we will be somewhere closer to 0% growth. Of course, the minute we are at 3% growth, we are actually creating more poor people. So when we get to 0% growth, that number gets even bigger. Our estimates show that we could actually 48 million more people could fall into poverty. The problem with that number is that in Africa, the depth of poverty is much deeper, which means that when people fall into poverty, they fall 40% further below than everybody else uh, when we talk about poverty. So that's an important and and very difficult statistic. Building back from that is going to be uh, uh, something quite challenging. Let me just come in here for a moment, Vera. Vera, I'll just come in here for a moment. It's not just that, is it? Because there are very few safety nets, welfare payment system in Africa. So when people feel it, they really do feel it. Exactly, exactly. There's two things. So one, there, 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 is, there are some safety nets uh, on the continent, but the problem is here that the people that are going to fall, the 48 million people that will fall into poverty, are not coming from the already poor. They're coming from the vulnerable, which essentially means they are part of that 60% of our small and medium enterprise culture that have been doing more or less okay, linked to supplying either government contracts and or being outsourced for large businesses, but have been in the informal sector, which means they are not officially registered anyway. And so when they fall into poverty, we don't know how to catch them. So even if you design a safety net system, we may not be able to find them. And that is the and that is sort of you know one of the big challenges that we have. But this is where I get some optimism. Last week at the ECA, we launched a program with five of the largest telcos on the continent. Actually, we now have 13 telcos that are participating in this. But they've all come together to work on creating one uh, a source code for every country. So co- governments can send out messages to people and say, "Let us know you're vulnerable, where you are." and how we can reach you. And we believe with this tool, we can reach about 714 million devices. Uh, I don't say people because, you know, some people have more than one device. So we're going to reach 714 million devices and we'll be able to identify, you know, where are the four neighborhoods and what's going on. More importantly, we'll be able to look at pricing and see what commodities are happening. And I think this is the first, it's never happened anywhere in the world before where all the telcos come together and use the same short code. Secondly, it will be a two-way messaging system. It's called the African Communications Information Platform. And, and it's a in collaboration, the United Nations and the large telcos on the continent. We are now covering 36 countries. We have 45 that have expressed interest. And we believe that in the next month, we should be able to roll this out. And so hopefully, it be, we are beginning to use telecommunication more uh, to provide information that maybe we can actually use this for digital ID down the road. And mm-hmm. so there is the, the sort of huge investment in ICT that are going to be needed. And, and I think that, you know, talking to CDC, as we begin to think of where do we want to look at investment, you know, the whole broadband, 
yeah. uh, a, a, a conversation is going to be quite important. Yeah. And then finally, of yeah. course, is the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement and all the work that's happening around people coming together and repurposing uh, industry for uh, pharmaceuticals and for PPEs. And we have a list of 177 companies who are working with the CDC in some cases that have now asked to repurpose their factories to see whether they can do things for PPEs. And this is the collaborative platform that is also coming up and we're quite excited about it. Yeah, wonderful. So um, some real initiatives, tangible initiatives there uh, amidst, as you say, some of the uh, gloom. But we heard Nick O'Donoghue talk earlier on about catalyst capital and the impact that this has on markets in Africa, where, of course, the perception is these are very risky markets. And so investors are not really um, interested in going there so much. So higher borrowing costs for um, projects in Africa. You've written recently, Vera, about the need to create a new sustainability and liquidity facility for Africa, which you say will cut borrowing costs for African governments by providing incentives for the private sector to increase their um, portfolio investments on the continent and accelerate job creation, which of course, as we've heard today, is so critical. I wonder if you could just tell us a bit more about that. No, thank you, Rachel Venable. I'm very happy that you asked about that. I think there is a lot of conversation today uh, um, in, in many spheres and uh, in many offices about Africa's debt. Um, I don't think that Africa's problem is a debt problem. Africa's problem today is a liquidity problem. If we don't solve the liquidity problem, we will get into a solvency problem, and then the debt will become a problem. I think when we talk about debt on the continent, we always tend to think debt is negative, but debt is a good thing. You know, if you cannot uh, contract debt, you can't grow. So you need to, to be able to, to, to contract debt, to be able to grow, and to be able to use it. So the question is, what's the rate of return on the investment? And this is where the question about getting cheaper rates becomes important. If you are going to raise resources, you know, I'm talking to the CDC, so it's UK pounds, you know, in pounds to build uh, an energy company, uh, uh, a factory in on the continent, where every consumer that is going to consume that energy is going to be paying back in local currency, and you have high international market interest rates, it makes it very, very difficult for countries to break even. Even though we have seen in countries like Senegal, in countries like Kenya, in countries like Cote d'Ivoire, that you know the utilities are getting better. In Uganda, the utilities actually turn positive. So we have some good stories on the continent when you know pricing and, and sort of the risk adjusted rate of return is commensurate with the demand. Now what are we proposing in this in the, the facility that they're asking for is essentially to see whether we can actually we have seen that the countries that have had access to markets and gotten extra liquidity to invest in infrastructure in particular, particularly in East Africa, but also in West Africa, are all going at 7 8%. So market access has paid off on the continent. Private investment has paid off on the continent. We believe that if we can have private investment at much cheaper rates, we will go faster, we will get people out of poverty faster, but we will also be providing much more liquid, more interesting investment opportunities for the West that today is earning negative rates in Europe and in America. So the, the facility that we're proposing, the facility that says, let's put some of the risk in the private sector hands, let's make it a little bit more liquid, but let's ensure that we can guarantee some credibility of the market, we can pull the risk and we can crush, crush the rate. I mean, you know, as in March, Africa's uh, uh, spread were about a thousand basis points impossible to go to the market with that kind of spread. Of course, they've contracted 700 basis points, but that is still much higher than the 400 we were going to market in January. We should probably be going, if you're Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, and Kenya, you should probably be going at 300 or 250. Yeah. With the facilities that we are putting in place, we hope that we'll be able to crowd in a different class of investors because we want to create a new asset class because we are making the instrument, Africa's yeah. paper, much more liquid. Okay. That's so the idea. And in wanting to create that new asset class to attract a new class of investors, what would you say is the role of a DFI like CDC um, within this current context that you're discussing? Um, you, you know, what, are there any sectors you think also that CDC should be targeting assistance to? And these are some of the questions that we're getting um, from our, um, our audience here. Super critical. I think that because, and thank you, that's a, a very important question, CDC remains 
one of the largest uh, uh, DFIs on the continent. I think that they have repurposed uh, um, their portfolio to come and be more aggressive on the continent to so accompany existing. I think there is a mistake now. People have started trying to look for new businesses. What you want to do is show up the businesses you've already invested in. And I think CDC is already doing that. We just need to make sure that those who were doing well before the crisis can make it through the crisis. So providing bridge financing, uh, in, increasing the risk sharing uh, uh, components of the investments, making sure, just like countries, that these businesses can get some more liquidity because we've seen also that you know exchange rates have tightened on the continent and so liquidity has become difficult even for those who are doing well. So I think if they can do that, more risk sharing, inject liquidity, maybe do some moratoria on payment if they have already gotten to the point where companies were paying back, that will be super critical. What yeah. investment should we keep doing? What we have seen is that energy investments are dropping because people are leaving and maybe also because company mm. countries are not able to pay. We mm. need to keep doing the infrastructure investments. Um, Africa is switching from more uh, uh, heavy fuel oil into gas and into yeah. into hydro. We are now at 40% of gas consumption. We need to do more of that. It's much cheaper. It's much more stable. Yeah. Its generation uh, uh, could improve development sure. on the continent. So I would say... ICT and energy. All right. Well, Vera, I'm going to invite back Nico Donahue, CEO of CDC, and also Yasmin Lamy, Deputy Chief Investment Officer, to join us in this conversation. You've just outlined there what you would like CDC to do, and they, um, Nick earlier on did talk about power being ignored by DFIs, and that's something that CDC is uh, doing a lot in that area. So, um, Nick, what's your response there to what uh, Vera has just outlined? Look, I think I agree with pretty much everything that Vera just said in terms of, and also in terms of, of priorities. And I think once, once the um, uh, uh, COVID happened, and I think, uh, uh, you know, Vera articulated very clearly, um, aside from the obvious health uh, uh, crisis that Africa's uh, undergoing, there is huge economic damage. It's ex exacerbated by the fall in natural resource prices. And it, as she said, and as the video said, we now have the first recession in 25 years in Africa. Probably, according to McKinsey, 10 million jobs lost uh, in the in the formal sector, 100 million jobs lost in the informal sector. So this is a huge uh, economic issue for for um, for Africa, and it's really important at a time like this. And what happens in these in these circumstances is that inevitably when crises happen, uh, investors around the world become more risk averse. And as they become more risk averse, their first reaction is to take money away from those places that are furthest away, that perhaps they know least about and they perceive to be great, ha having the greatest risk. And that's what happens in, 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 in and that is what has happened in Africa. And, um, the role of the development finance institutions in those circumstances is to be counter cyclical. It's to step forward to fill the gap of, 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 of commercial money and banking money being withdrawn. And, in, and as Vera absolutely rightly says, the first role is to make sure that the investments that you've made over the last, in CDC's case, the last 72 years, that those, that those, in, those in many cases, um, uh, great companies that are going through this uh, extraordinary crisis, that they have the working capital and the liquidity they need to survive. Right. And so that's been a key focus for, for CDC. Sure. Um, and then the other, and then in addition to that, then you've got to look at specific, I think Levere is absolutely right to focus on liquidity. That has been the challenge in, in the biggest challenge in a crisis like this. And so we've tried to step up with our banking partners to provide more liquidity. And we've also um, tried to use our, our some our our catalyst money, but all uh, um, to try to strengthen uh, and and identify key areas. It's probably useful for me to bring in Yasmin now. Yasmin's yes, role is to is, is to be the catalyst uh, CIO, and she can maybe talk a little bit more detail about what we're doing there. Thank Thanks, you. Nick. Hi, Zainab, and thank Hi. you, Vera. It's really a pleasure to be part of this conversation today. Yeah, so I think um, I also fully agree, and it's it's um, really nice to see the alignment between the way CDC has been thinking about responding to the COVID crisis and the way you outlined it from the UNECA standpoint, Vera. Um, there's also building work going on in my house, so if you hear some background noise, that's <laughs> the joy of being in lockdown during webinars. You're, you're building back better, Yasmin. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, you know, CDC 
first, when we, when we sat down and said, okay, this is, um, there's a crisis going on, we need to rethink how we're working. Um, we thought about the three different challenges in front of us. So first was the healthcare challenge, essentially survival at a time when there was a pandemic, but also uh, borders were closing and lockdowns meant that food value chains were also being disrupted to a severe effect. Um, secondly, we thought about the macroeconomic challenge, and I think Vera's right about, you know, she's described that in some detail. And then you also put in context the fact that some of these countries were not able to deliver the types of fiscal responses that we saw here in the UK or in other markets in Europe or in the US, for example. And then thirdly, the livelihood challenge. I mean, Nick has already touched on the, the amount of job losses that are expected, especially in the informal sector. And I think Vera's also referenced that. Um, and I think it's worth also highlighting the percentage of women that are likely to be uh, among that cohort of, of informal jobs lost. And so when we thought about how CDC should respond, we thought about those kind of three challenges and set up our response along, along the spectrum of those three. So first priority was, can we preserve the impact that we've worked so hard to achieve in our existing portfolio? So we've been investing for over 70 years for job creation. So looking at this potential you know, next year or two where we would suddenly put all that impact at risk was a, a really severe wake up call, I think. And we went straight away into a dynamic of shifting the way our investment committee gathered. So we had watch list calls by product every week, you know, staying very close to the portfolio and talking about uh, preserving impact and preserving value at the companies that were already in our portfolio. The second pillar of our response was, was called strengthen and was really in line with what you described, Vera, as that priority of liquidity into the market. So the bulk of what sits under our strength and response investments is about systemic liquidity. We designed that pillar with a set of impact priorities that laid out target beneficiary groups with priority towards those who are most vulnerable and in urgent need of, of liquidity support but also recognizing that there were, you know, from all the way down to microfinance institutions, all the way up to systemically important banks, the entire system would need support, um, but recognizing that those who needed support first should get it first. Um, we have committed just under $400 million in that program of systemic liquidity um, over the last few months. Really proud of that work. It's really through um, short-term working capital trade finance type structures. And so hopefully reaching as, as kind of far down the value chain as some of the smallest, micro, uh, sm smallest enterprises that would be um, in that universe. And then thirdly, I think it's worth noting that we have also, you know, we have a pillar called rebuild, which is returning to our, our standard way of operating for investment, um, for development impact and thinking about ourselves as a long-term partner in the markets where we invest. Okay, thanks for that, Yasmin and Nick. So Vera of CDC saying they are long-term partners, not fair weather friends. Uh, are you content with the response that you've heard from uh, the CDC team about just what they are doing in reaction to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic? No, I think that's fantastic. And I think particularly on the working capital uh, conversation on the trade finance, that's the first one that dries up, which means again that... Uh, 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 Yasmin talked about the SMEs and the women. That really is that sort of quick turnaround uh, capital, which keeps jobs, but also keeps businesses open. It's, it's particularly important. Um, I, I want to go back and talk about energy and ICT in the build back sector as, as, as key areas of, of emphasis and focus, which they're already doing, and looking at you know how we do the transition into 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 renewables so through gas, most likely. I, I, I want to talk about that as well. So yes, I think uh, a lot is happening. We need a lot more. I think that one of the things PVC has done as a leader is also bring together the other DFIs, because you know DFIs, like most people, also look at who's going in and what are they doing, and then they come in. And, uh, I, I want to just thank the team for joining some of our DFI calls and, and, and sort of, you know, leaning forward at this time. Right, thank you. Yes, you mentioned there, um, and I'll just come very quickly, final point to uh, Nick Orr and uh, Yasmin, the point that uh, Vera just made there. I mean, obviously there's a huge gas pipeline in Mozambique to access offshore gas for domestic use and export, huge $15.5 billion project. Uh, what do you think the impact is going to be on that transition, you know, to energy that uh, Vera, the transition to, to new forms, cleaner forms of energy is going to be amidst all this debate we're having. 
So why don't I take that? I think, um, and we will be spending one of the, obviously Amelie talked earlier about our climate strategy and, to, and the next session that we're doing, I think on Thursday, we're going to uh, talk ex exclusively about that. But clearly the transition to, um, uh, to uh, uh, renewables in Africa is a critical a story that's going to play out over the next decade or two decades and it's critically important for organizations like CDC to be, to be providing um, affordable capital to help develop uh, particularly solar, wind, geothermal um, in Africa. And so that's, a, that's, as we'll talk about in the future session, that's a, that, that's a key priority. And I agree with Vera also that, that um, that gas is an important uh, transition fuel. It needs to be thought of as a transition fuel. Uh, but it, the reason that, um, uh, that uh, all the African countries are laying out sort of country pathways to net zero, net zero by 2050 is to allow, is a recognition of the fact um, that uh, for many of them, gas is a critical, uh, um, a critical resource uh, that's available and, and provides base load power in a way that um, that solar and wind uh, today doesn't do exactly. so. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a, it's um, it's a transition. Absolutely, a transition fuel needs to be thought about that way, thought about selectively. But it is important. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for the moment, Nick, and thank you to you, Yasmin, Vera. Thank you to you. I don't know if you just want the last thirty seconds to um, give your brief closing remarks to everybody. No, thank you very much. I think that what Africa has shown in this crisis, uh, even as we talk about the debt conversation, is the fact that we are mature. We have matured. We are not talking about cancellation. We're talking about a bridge to get over the crisis for many of our countries, particularly the ones in which CDC is working. We have market access. But we would like to have better market access and a lot more liquidity. So I think even for CDC, you're doing a lot on the continent. You need to do more. So hopefully we can raise more capital even from you as we come out on the other side of this crisis. So we see you more bringing blended financing uh, um, for uh, development as we get out. I think it's clear at the end of this crisis that Africa can fast track and, and we could. We may be have lost some momentum on 2030, but I think if we all came back together quickly, we may not have lost that much. But we can use this as an opportunity to fast track a few things. Oh, wonderful. So fast track, leapfrog and all the rest of it. Thank you so much indeed, Vera Song, the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. We're sorry we could not see you, but we were very glad that we could hear you loud and clear. And I'm sure on behalf of everybody, I wish you and all your colleagues working right across the continent every success in your endeavours at this very difficult time steering um, the future of the continent. Thank you so much indeed, Vera, and uh, goodbye to you in Addis there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Vera with there. So, um, Nick, I'd like you to stay on the line. Yasmin, thank you very much indeed. If I could invite the chairman, Graham Wrigley, back to um, join us. So, um, Graham, um, you were listening to Vera there, obviously saying that welcomes the, um, the, the help that uh, CDC has been giving in partnership to uh, across the continent of Africa. Um, would like to see you do more. We've heard about how um, you've opened up these new offices um, across the continent in, you know, with Lagos, you mentioned, and, and other places. So it, Africa remains very much as part of your key central strategy, doesn't it, Graham? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, it does. Uh, you know, as I said in my internet remarks, you know, the strategy, you know, in 2000. 11 to 12, you know, really focused on that. But, but also, you know, I, I, you know, we should also talk about South Asia. You know, one of the biggest things, changes we made in the last, um, you know, two to three years under, with Nick is expand our South Asian presence. We now have you know, really senior teams in Bangladesh and Pakistan and just open up an office in Nepal. And these are also, you know, really important, sizable countries. Uh, with, um, you know, I think over the next 10 years, you know, significant need for our capital as well. Okay. So, but Africa and South Asia, that's our focus. Yeah. Okay, so Graham and Nick, we've got lots of questions that are um, coming in for you now. So um, 
I'm just going to, uh, listen, I'm going to have to discuss, bring in the elephant in the Zoom, if you don't mind my saying that, but the elephant in the Zoom, because I can see there are lots of people who are asking questions about this, about the, what your view is on the uh, merger between DFID and uh, the FCO. So let's just address that now, please. Okay. Fine. So, so Nick, I'll probably uh, I'll, I'll 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 take that question. So, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, you know, this is an area for the government and ministers, um, and you know, it's a very important one, and it will have implications at some stage on CDC. Um, you know, CDC in our seventy-two year history have worked with many parts of government, and you know, we will. You know, I, I commit as chairman, uh, as long as I am chairman, to carry on delivering our mission, but working very closely with uh, uh, with HMG. And um, you know, that's that that's just how it is. I mean, in terms of observations on the merger, uh, you know, speaking from CDC's perspective, um, uh, you know, I mean, I think first of all, as the prime minister himself said in Parliament. You know, DFID has had an amazing history. You know, hundreds of millions of lives have been changed. You know, and I, I've seen that in my work in development the last 15 years, whether it's, you know, through the work on vaccines, you hear Bill Gates talk about the transformation impact of, of DFID, um, M-PESA, you know, it's, you know all yeah. across many, many places. Um, and I think the, you know, the team at DFID and the UK should be very proud of those achievements. All right. Um, uh, sorry, Graham. I'm just going to add one to that question because we've had from the Earl of Sandwich asking, with the DFID FCO merger, there'll be a greater need, he says, for transparency in reporting to Parliament and to ICAI. I guess that's the Independent Commission for Aid Impact, which um, scrutinises aid spending in the UK. Will CDC do more to explain its work to MPs and peers? He's asking. Yeah, I mean, we, well, we, you know, absolutely, we will all, I mean, nothing changes in terms of scrutiny that we, 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 we do get and should get. And, you know, we, um, uh, you know, we, we've been having outreach the whole time. I think Sarah Champion's on this call now. We've been, I've had a meeting with her, you know, pretty much after she started with another one coming up in, in a week's time. We've met many of the IDC members. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I, you know, obviously since the murder, I've spoken with the Secretary of State, she's very clear. You know, you carry on executing the strategy, doing the COVID response you've talked about. And, you know, but in September, you know, oversight of CDC will go to the Foreign Secretary um, with the F FCDO. But, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we have to adapt to that new reality, whatever it is, and carry on doing our mission. Okay. Thank you. A uh, question from Morton Searstead, um, probably to you, Nick. What are some of the key general constraints, non-COVID-19 related, he's asking, to making new investments? Is there, for example, a business planning skills gap amongst entrepreneurs? If so, what does CDC do to support potential investors in this regard? Yeah, I think um, uh, uh, there are... Um, uh, a whole range of different challenges in investing in the regions in which we invest. And the skills gap is certainly, uh, and certainly one of them. We obviously work directly. We have a small grant program. We work directly with companies to try and help fill some of that. We've, uh, we've, uh, be, we've um, uh, uh, been responsible for an organization called the Africa List over the last four or five years, which tries to bring together uh, entrepreneurs and, and business leaders in, 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 in now about seven or eight African countries to try to improve networking and, and, uh, and learning. Uh, but, you know, um, and that, that is one of the, clearly one of the challenges. But the challenges, the other challenges, if we talk about Africa, the other challenges are, as they have always been, it, you, you scalable markets, and that's where um, the free trade, free trade zones potentially could be very helpful. Um, lack, lack of domestic uh, capital markets. Um, uh, I think um, uh, 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 consistent governance, and I, and and we have uh, countries now. Uh, a whole, actually, a, a, a significant number of countries now that are really very supportive of growth in the private sector, uh, and that makes a huge difference. And those are countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda, Ghana. 
um, and that makes a huge difference in terms of making uh, in, in, in terms of making countries own. And of course, infrastructure. Vera mentioned infrastructure, and you know, it's it's really difficult to run a business if you don't have access to reliable base pay, base load power. So that remains a critical right. need in, in in Africa. So, gentlemen, I'm getting lots of questions. So I want to get in as many as I can. So some rapid fire questions and answer questions from Dr. Nick Westcott. What is CDC doing in in the ICT sector? Where are critical adaptations of mobile apps, for instance, and so on and so forth to the African market? I guess that's one for so, you, Nick. Yeah, yeah. So uh, ICT, I completely, and I made it in my introductory remarks, I think one of the things that CDC and other development finance institutions can do is invest in, in ICT, and it's a critical enabler for companies that allow them to, you know, reach, uh, reach more, um, uh, um, uh, uh, more vulnerable and disadvantaged part of the population. We have a specific venture capital program that we've been running for the last uh, two years that's providing funding to venture capital firms based in Africa. Uh, we have a co-investment program that runs alongside of that, um, mm -hmm. which has helped us to invest in, 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 in smaller companies. Uh, and so, um, so it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's obviously a difficult and risky area to invest in, as it is everywhere. But from a development perspective, it has the, it has the, it ha, it has the potential of really just transforming uh, many of these industries. So it's, 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 it's very important for us to be active in it. Sure. Thanks, Graham. Uh, ben Constable Maxwell, given the scale of the challenge of this decade of SDG action, is there a framework that CDC advocates to prioritise how public and private capital respectively can be most efficiently directed towards individual goals and the SDGs more broadly? That is a great question. Um, and if you look at our strategy, our strategies, um, you know, the first strategy was about the grid, moving away from the geographies to focus in on the poorest countries and a few key sectors. The next strategy, the one that we're now three and a half years into executing, so a year and a half to go, is, um, was all about um, refining, as you heard today, the development impact tools, bringing in catalyst, this new policy for high risk, and they're developing cost-cutting themes on gender, climate change, and job quality. And you heard Jen and Emily talk about the work in that. We're now starting to think about the next strategy period, which starts from uh, you know, January 2022. And I think you know, the, the, the framing of this more explicitly in the SDGs uh, and, and homing in on those areas where CDC can make an own distinctive contribution because as Nick said in his, in his remarks, we can't do everything. And, 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 you know, and there's an independent review of us being carried out by DFID at the moment, and that's going to help inform the policy choices that the shareholder and, and us will have to agree on what the form the next strategy should be. It's a great question. Okay, thanks very much. All right, and a uh, specific question on a project here, perhaps for you, Nick. Ian Shapiro asks, does climate smart, genuinely affordable housing provide an appropriate counter-cyclical investment opportunity for CDC to be a pioneer in response to COVID-19? Uh, the answer to that is yes. The affordable housing is a, um, is, uh, has the potential to be a critical investment area. I mean, to be honest, I think it's been, we have struggled as many development finance institutions have to find um, affordable ho housing projects in particularly in Africa or even in, in India um, that uh, really work. But I have high hopes, and I think Ian may be directly involved. I have high hopes for some of these more, you know, we're finding cheaper, cheaper, more flexible ways of building housing. And I think there is an, a long-term opportunity for development finance to, uh, to, um, uh, 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 to, participate in those. Okay, and another one probably for you, Nick. What portfolios have recorded the most growth or show potential for financial and sustainable growth from somebody who's written and says, regards, TS? <laughs> um, so which portfolios, um, I wonder, do we mean which, which countries or which sectors? That's normally probably countries is my sense, yeah. uh, you know, which so countries, yeah. Look, I think that kind of, uh, we have development challenges and investment opportunities in all the countries that we uh, that we uh, are invest in, and in, in Africa alone, and CDC has investments in 34 different countries. But I think there are certain countries that have 
um, the advantages of real scale, which is important in, in, in assessing investment opportunities, and also, um, uh, and as I said, pro-private sector uh, governments. And the countries in our, the countries that immediately spring to mind in our sort of area of oper region of operation that sort of fit those criteria are Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, which is why we've opened offices in both of those places, Egypt, where we're shortly will be opening an office, and Ethiopia. There are four examples of countries that have, I think, significant, of large countries that have significant uh, potential uh, for development capital. And then alongside that, there's a, there are, you know, Rwanda, Ghana, um, uh, um, Nigeria, and Kenya, just because of their size and importance. Mm -hmm. Those are all countries, I think, which are, and those are typically, that those are the places generally that we're putting, um, uh, we're putting uh, resources in people. Okay. There was a question related to that about your specific investments in uh, Nigeria and Ghana, but that's probably too detailed to go into for the time that we have, because I'm conscious that we need to finish. But I'll put this last one to you, Graham. Um, Post-COVID-19 post -COVID discussions are going to be focusing on establishing a new normal, asks Francis. So how do we encourage investing for the SDGs to form part of this new normal? Yeah, <clears throat> I think... I think the implications of COVID are not yet known fully. Um, and I think it's going to have such profound an impact. You know, Nick talked and Yasmin talked about our response. It affects the way we work. How do we invest, you know, when you can't travel? And that's a short and there's a short term issue there. And a medium term there about how do office spaces work. In terms of Africa and the long term implications for the flow of capital which is going to be profound you know whole industries ethiopian textile industry um you know the scale of the money as vera was talking about that is being you know used in the north at the moment to counter covid and is, is moving away from the continent is just huge so you know I, I think we, we, we increasingly think that, as you know, I talked about the SDGs and the strategy period, and we've already started building it. Our team are building the, the COVID world into that thinking, but precisely what that means, I honestly think it is too early to tell, but it will be very significant. Well, very quickly to both of you, just in a minute, how has COVID-19 affected the way you work? I know, Graham, you're not jumping on a plane as often as uh, you would normally be doing so, but just give us a, a final word on the impact on the way you work. I, I'd say, I, I'd say the best thing about working in this, this event is by, so this process is, you know, as we're expanding our offices, you know, having everybody level in front of you on one screen, brings an equal voice from all our international offices. And I think that is, that's one of the big positives we've had from this event, whether it's Habib or Tembiti or Srini or KK or Andrew Ali or Dolika, they're all in the room. And I think that is, I think that's something we want to keep, you know, going forward. So Nick, what about you? Some changes in this way of new way of working that you want to hang on to because you value them? How's it affected the way you work? Yeah, no, I agree with everything Graham said. I mean, obviously from a practical basis, it's, it's meant that we're all working from home. Uh, I mean, the biggest probably, probably practical uh, issue for CDC is that we don't do, we're not in a position to travel in the way we did. But I think we've, we're, we're learning from that, that there is, uh, as we go through the, uh, um, the, what we can do, that we can do most everything that we were able to do before. We have to be perhaps a little bit more creative about the way we do it. Uh, we have to rely more on local offices. We have to rely more on uh, local people on the ground, on partners and other development finance institutions. But I think the learning is that there's a lot that you can do through partnership and collaboration uh, that, uh, uh, that maybe uh, before you did, you sort of did yourself because you felt you had to. Thanks very much indeed, Nick, and thank you, Graham. It's been my pleasure to uh, have presented this portion of the um, annual review towards a decade of action and looking at the impact of COVID-19 on markets and the way that CDC operates. Um, on the 2nd of July, as Graham said at the beginning, climate action, investing in clean and inclusive growth will be the focus of that event. And on the 7th of July, 
creating decent work and generating economic growth. Um, that we've looked, you know, the three key areas that uh, CDC has been focusing on. So it's been my pleasure to be with all of you. I've enjoyed it and learned uh, from listening to all the discussions. I hand over to you for the final word, Graham, but it's goodbye from me. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab, for coming today and doing this so expertly as you always do. And also thank you for your leadership at the Royal African Society, where we, where we do a lot of work together, CDC and you. Thank you to Vera for taking the time out today and for all the work you do at bringing the voice of Africa to the most senior of government, um, uh, you know, gov government discussions across the world. To the audience and anybody who's not on the call but has given us, you know, praise or criticism, you know, we thank you uh, for the, the time you did, you know, you, you did this year. Uh, for all our partners on the ground in Africa and South Asia, um, you know, we thank you for that. I want to thank our shareholder at the UK government, um, the Secretary of State, all the ministers, and, and in particular uh, to all the team at DFID for their amazing work and challenge, a lot of challenge uh, and support. Um, and finally, just to thank, as I said at the beginning, the remarkable team at CDC, uh, um, particularly for their work uh, and effort during COVID. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe, everybody. And uh, we look forward to keeping on driving our mission and see you next year.